Hello, everyone. It's noon Pacific on Friday. That means one thing, that's relentless learning. And I want to present on what I'm considering, I'm talking about is my big idea, which is not that big. It won't take probably the 10 minutes that I have allotted, so I'll give a Tanner's presentation. But I do want to share uh, my screen with you. I've got some slides. Um, you don't have to have slides. I don't think Tanner does. I do because I forget things if I don't have slides. So I'm using that more for me probably than for you, but it, maybe it'll be helpful for you. Um, I talked about metaphors as a, as a bridge to seeing things differently, and I'm very big on that subject. And the more and more I get out in this world, this VUCA world, and I talk with people and I work with large companies and, and transformation and everything, I think it's really important how we see the world. I think agilists, uh, not maybe the agile industrial complex, which sometimes we complain about, but agilists, people who are concerned about agility, we see the world sometimes different than other folks. We have our own lenses and mental models. And I think it's really important how we see the world because it determines what we think about the world and how we behave in the world. So if you need somebody to see things that you're seeing or you want somebody to see things that you're seeing, then how do you go about doing that? If they've never seen these things before and we do it in education by, by doing, uh, having a common vision and, and that common vision is generally through metaphors. We have some kind of bridge that we use. It's metaphors, similes, et cetera, a story sometimes. And these things are really important and critical. And as I was reflecting on it, that's not the big idea. I've already done that one. But as I was reflecting on this concept of metaphors being so critical to the work that we do, especially in what I would consider organizational and individual change, because organizational change may be slightly different, but if we can't change the individuals in the organization, we're probably going to not be too successful in, in, in overall organizational change. I don't want to say they're the same thing, but they're very similar. And we have to win the hearts and minds, so to speak, of the people, and we have to be able to get them to see what we're seeing. Um, when I gave this talk originally, I mean, think of any of the quote unquote great leaders that that people follow to this day, people who still, you know, may, may be dead for a thousand, two thousand years. It's the vision of the world that we follow. It's the vision of the world that inspires us. And they did speak in metaphors um, in the Bible. They're parables. They're just metaphors. Right. Um, so. The big idea was when we're trying to connect with people and get them to see the world the way we see it, we have to choose metaphors that are our audience's metaphors. And this is something that, that kind of went past me for a while. Um, and I'm just kind of getting on to it now because it does make sense. I have a whole host, a whole box of metaphors, but if my metaphors are something that, that you don't, don't have experience with, it's not going to do us a whole lot of good when I try to bring you from one side of the bridge to the other side, so to speak. And so I think that a good term for this is empathy. I think it's one of the factors of empathy is that we first try to see things through somebody else's world. So I, I did a, a quick search on sympathy versus empathy because I remember being taught that many years ago that these things are similar, but they're not the same. What I was doing sometimes when I used my metaphors in the past and I, I, I vowed to do better in the future is I've gone from a point of maybe sympathy or something akin to sympathy where I feel for somebody else. But it's really my feeling is the sympathy. It's not the feeling of the other person, per se, whereas empathy is really trying to share the feelings of another person, stepping into their shoes and seeing things more from their perspective. And I know this isn't like earth shattering stuff, folks, but we do have a tendency, I think, as we go along in our daily lives to forget it. When we're using metaphors to help people understand things, we have a tendency to do so in things that we're experts in or things that we know and not always what our audience knows. So the example I use is sports metaphors. I have a ton of them. Sports was a big part of my life. And when we talk about things, especially in the agile world or, or in the VUCA world about teams, and I think you all realize that teams are different than groups of individuals. A lot of, a lot of times, I'm sure Tanner sees this too. I'll go into an organization and say, we have, we have teams. Can you help our teams? And then I'll go in there and I'll find out they're not really teams. They're just a, a collection of individuals. There's, there's a difference between the two. 
And, and it's something certainly that, that I'll probably delve into uh, in a future uh, Relentless Learning episode is to talk about the fact that they're not the same thing, but, but sports teams are, are, I think, pure teams. Um, and it's really easy because it's almost like a controlled experiment to, to watch sport te sports teams and understand sports teams and how they work. And in my world, I spent most of my time with two sports. Um, my favorite of all time, because uh, if anybody who's watched the show before or listened to me speak knows that I'm a huge fan of American football. I use a lot of American fo football metaphors. It always doesn't work very well. Um, because a lot of times the audience I'm talking to, they, there might not be a lot of Native Americans in those audiences, people born in the United States or people Amer even familiar with American football, even if they were born in the United States. A lot of teams, obviously, we work with. We work with a lot of folks from India. India, cricket's a big sport, from my understanding. And, and should I talk about American football or should I talk about cricket? Well, I know American football. And I don't know a lot about cricket. But what I vowed to do in the future, because I know I'm going to work with a lot of people who might understand cricket better than American football, I'm going to do a little research. I'm going to find out a little bit about it. Because I think it's going to be important for me to take cricket and use some of the things in cricket and metaphors from that sport. If the people that I'm talking to would be more familiar with it. Now, I would love if we're all familiar with American football because I come up with great metaphors for that. And I'm going to stumble a little, with, a little with the cricket metaphors, but I think it's worth the effort, right? Um, I think in order to be successful, we have to do a couple of things. And this is just some random thoughts, basically. We need to have a, a multitude of, of metaphors from, from many different domains because we have to be able to know that our audience are going to be coming from all kinds of different domains. And, and I am a proud liberal arts grad. I went to a tiny school called Kenyon College in Ohio. Some of you might be familiar with it. This is a good argument for liberal arts education because the more well-rounded we are as individuals, the more well-read we are as, as individuals, the more we've experienced the world as individuals, the, the more metaphors we're going to be able to pull. And the odds of us actually finding metaphors that will match others will be pretty good. You need to do the research. You need to do the work. And I'm saying I need to. These are these are this is Larry's list uh, or backlog of things. I, I need to do research in areas that most of my audience is going to understand these things. Um, and it's not always American football, though. I'm not going to give up on those metaphors. I need a curiosity and openness to learn things that are foreign to me. I don't always have that. And as I look back, I'm, I'm, every day we should grow and get better. I'm finding that sometimes I was a little bit more closed minded than I should be. And that I need to experience the world in all its glory and, and, and those things that are foreign to me and sometimes more uncomfortable for me, which means I also need the humility to allow myself to be a novice. I, I, I would like to think uh, with American football that I, I'm kind of an expert because I played for, you know, over a decade. And I'm not. I'm a novice when it comes to cricket, but maybe those metaphors are going to be better. I have to humble myself and say, OK, I'm 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 not that good at it. And I have to have the resiliency to make mistakes and then carry on. And when I do, and this is the last thing, and this is a thing that we all need, by the way, and, and I try to cultivate is a sense of humor. When I make mistakes, I'm going to make mistakes. If I'm going to start using metaphors from, from a world that I'm not 100% comfortable with or don't 100% know, I'm going to make mistakes. So you got to be able to laugh at yourself. I think that's, a, that's a kind of a superpower is the ability to laugh at yourself. So again, it, 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 it relates to these things like humility and curiosity and openness. So... Maybe not a huge idea, but I thought it was something that was worthy of sharing.